thank you, Walter, and good evening, everyone. And as Walter said, it is my real pleasure to introduce Secretary of the Treasury, Jacob Liu. Now, Jack is a man whose signature will soon be, at least in a few months, it'll be on dollar bills. And it has the distinction of even being less legible than my signature, and, and that's not easy to do. He is also a man who, unlike uh, Tim Geithner and me, will never have to defend the TARP. <laughs> but, but hey, he's got the IRS, you know. And, 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 and uh, he has uh, unveiled very recently a new tool that helps the public track TARP funding, which is a good news story, so thank you for that, Jack. A and in all seriousness, this is a man that has held several very important, very tough jobs for two different administrations. He's been director of the Office of Management of the Budget for President Bill Clinton. And for those of you who don't know what the director of OMB does, it's, it's really quite a comprehensive job. You have to ha understand the federal budget, and it gives you a real working knowledge of government. And then more recently, obviously, White House Chief of Staff for President Obama. And of course, that's 24-7. There's no job that's more demanding in the federal government. And as Treasury Secretary, he's hit the ground running, already traveled to China, to Europe, to engage with their, their leaders on important issues. And uh, I know for a fact the Chinese leaders were very impressed. And he's handled already multiple hearings. That's a real joy as Treasury Secretary, getting to experience a hearing. But he's, he's done that with great skill and aplomb. And of course, this isn't a congressional committee today. This is a friendly audience, and it's a moderated discussion with David Leonhard. And I don't know if you, you all read his columns with the New York Times, but for important economic issues, there's no one that goes into real depth, and he knows how to make complicated issues simple. And as someone that knows how to make simple issues complicated, I really appreciate <laughs> what he could do. So anyway, let me now say, uh, first of all, welcome the uh, 76th Treasury Secretary of the United States of America and David Leonhardt. Thank you very much, Secretary Paulson. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for joining us, Secretary Liu. Good to be here. Um, let's dive right in. Um, let's start on a, on a, s a slightly personal note. Secretary Paulson mentioned that you've had a variety of experiences here. So you've been Deputy Secretary of State under President Obama, Chief of Staff, Head of OMB, and now Treasury Secretary. Uh, I think you now qualify as the Democratic James Baker. Uh, and I'd love it if you could now if you could just give us a little bit of insight um, into this president and this administration, the kind of things we don't necessarily see day to day. What have you seen that's surprised you or we, m we may not know from the outside? Well, let me start with something that um, may be obvious, but it's not. There, there's often people comment that the president isn't open to outsiders. I am the exception to the rule that proves that that's not correct. Uh, I met the president during the transition, and I am now I guess, an insider. But he, I'm somebody he brought in uh, because he wanted me to be part of his team, even though we didn't know each other. And I've gotten to know him very well, obviously, in a variety of roles. And I guess I'd say this. Um, he is uh, he's one of the smartest people that you can engage with. Broadly uh, knowledgeable, well-read, listens, remembers, um, could easily jump into the technical work that each of us do. Um, and he is, I think, as good as anyone I've ever seen at going in and out of the detail so that he rolls up his sleeves and he'll work with you know, anyone on anything. Uh, he would work with you know, Ray LaHood on transportation policy. He would work with me on our development assistance policy, even when I was Deputy Secretary of State. But he always has the ability to take a step back and to tell the group to remember to ask itself the question, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? Are we on track? And he goes back and forth between the tactical and the strategic to make sure that you keep your North Star in front of you. 
And I've always found that very impressive because it's easy in Washington to get totally caught up in the minute move of the moment. And you have to pay attention to those, and he does, but he manages to make sure that you keep both the big picture and the detail in perspective. Do you think he's having fun? <laughs> I think, uh, like all presidents, there are good days and there are bad days, but it's a great job. <laughs> Um, we're now at this, this funny moment, uh, and I've spent enough time with Treasury Secretaries to know you will say nothing about the Fed. So I'm going to mention Ben Bernanke, but I don't expect you to engage with I that portion that. of it. Um, uh, I, there's a little bit of deja vu I worry about, which is um, uh, we've just had Ben Bernanke and others come out and say the economy seems to be healing. And um, so that's, that's 2013. I feel like we saw that in 2012 and 2011 and 2010. And each time, things have been a little bit disappointing. There's always been a reason. Uh, gas prices here, something else there. Uh, how confident should we be that this economy is really in the stage, really in a self-sustaining recovery, as opposed to something that six months from now is going to feel like we're just stuck again in a really low gear? David, I think there are a lot of signs that there is a, a, a real recovery underway. Uh, you see it in virtually every sector. You know, some months numbers go up and down. You can't look for everything to move in a perfect harmony every month. But the, the GDP growth, the unemployment rate, job growth, none of it is fast as we would like, but directionally for four years moving in the right direction. We're seeing it in manufacturing. We're seeing it in many different ways in terms of the housing uh, industry, which is so much a driver of the economy. There are a lot of risks out there, and I'm way too superstitious uh, to say that everything is going to just continue without any bumps in the road. There certainly will be bumps in the road. Even in a healing, healthy economy, there are bumps in the road. But we've seen a resilience that's shown through in a remarkably broad series of measures of the economy. I think that one of the things that we have to do in Washington is make sure that we don't have another round of self-inflicted wounds. I think that there were some of the economic uh, setbacks or periods of, of growth that got cut short that were affected by policy in Washington. 2011 was a really rough year on confidence. So we have to make sure there are no more self-inflicted wounds like that. I think the core economy is showing that it is resilient and has strength. So I am very optimistic about the prospects for the American economy. The most obvious potential self-inflicted wound would be the debt ceiling, I think. Um, should we be optimistic that we're not going to go through uh, another 2011 situation? I certainly hope so. Um, you know, I think that the president has made clear, I've made clear, uh, that we cannot be in a position ever again where you're negotiating over whether or not the U.S. government can default. I don't know any responsible leader who really believes that there should be a debate about whether to default or not. And the American people shouldn't be put through that. The American economy shouldn't be put through that. Congress is going to have to figure out how to deal with it. The thing about the debt limit that is you know, just a fact, it is really retrospective. You re need to raise the debt limit because of decisions Congress made in the past to authorize spending. And it has been the policy that's not the United States for you know, the better part of 250 years that when we incur bills, we pay them. One of the things that, that strikes me when you go back and look at the historical numbers, whether it's the 1980s or the late 1990s, those growth numbers in GDP and jobs, they just feel like they're from another planet. Is this, is this sort of the new normal, uh, two, two and a half percent growth? Or is there any reason to hope that at some point in the foreseeable future we could get to really healthy three plus, maybe even four percent growth? Is, are there reasons that that's not a fair yardstick to have anymore? I think that the 1990s saw rates of growth that were substantially higher than three and three and a half. So to use the 1990s as the benchmark probably is not realistic. But I think that we are seeing that in a year when there has been substantial headwind from federal policy, we w withdrew the payroll tax cut as a matter of policy, and we have seen across the board cuts in sequestration take effect by default because Congress didn't enact a different alternative in terms of middle and long-term balanced policies. Cumulatively, it's been well over a percent, probably closer to a one and a half percent drag on the economy. We're growing at two percent anyway. So the core economy is trying to grow faster than two percent. When it can get to three or over three, I can't predict with precision. But it's on a trajectory that's clearly in, moving in the right direction 
And next year, we're not going to have that kind of you know, headwind coming from federal fiscal policy. So we could do a lot better. We could replace the sequester with a balanced set of longer-term savings and revenues. Uh, that would free up, you know, a half a percent of GDP. Uh, but even if we were to not do that, we're not going to have another round of drag next year of the same magnitude. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that the, the, the core economy is, is trying to get to a better rate. I wish I could say four and five were numbers we could think about, but I don't think there's anyone predicting that. Um, if the economy were growing north of 3%, we'd start catching up on the kinds of job creation that we really need to fully dig out of the hole of the worst recession since the Great Depression. We're on the right trajectory. We're making progress. We've created a lot of new jobs, uh, but we still have more work to do. You mentioned the payroll tax. A lot of the austerity is stuff that the president and you have opposed. But the withdrawing of the payroll tax, the allowing it to snap back to where it had been, is something that you all supported. In retrospect, and maybe it's just 2020 hindsight, it, was that a mistake? The deficit is, is really coming down very rapidly. Um, unemployment is not coming down as rapidly. Growth is weak. A lot of Americans are struggling. If you could do it again, uh, would you go back in time and extend the payroll tax cut further? David, the payroll tax cut was something that always had to be temporary for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason is the impact on the, on the deficit, obviously. But another reason is the financing of Social Security is undermined if you permanently or for a very long period of time you know, shift the funding from the payroll tax to essentially general revenue to replace the payroll tax. So I think that there was a broad understanding that at the earliest moment when it could be done in a way that could be managed by the economy, um, you, the payroll tax cut would have to go. Could you have had it for six more months or another year? We would have had the same issue at any point that it was going to be taking one time, you know, a kind of chunk out of the economy. And I think the layering sequestration on top of that is, was really put the economy to the test. And I think to the credit of the resilience of the economy, the economy's fighting back. I mean, the fact that we're growing at 2%, notwithstanding both the intended and the unintended deficit reduction, I think when you, if you look at the kind of larger fiscal frame, two years ago, we were talking about the need to reduce deficits by $4 trillion over 10 years. You've done it. And we've done it. The problem is the composition isn't perfect. Uh, the taxes that we enacted in the beginning of this year were a step in the right direction, but there's more work that needs to be done on taxes. We thought we went far enough in the Budget Control Act on discretionary spending. Sequestration went farther than you know, many of us think makes sense. It's now not a question about how much deficit reduction. It's a question of composition. And I think that the challenge we have now is to shift from a very long debate about um, how to reduce the deficit, or whether we need to reduce the deficit, to a question of you know, what, are, what do we need to do to build the country, the foundation in this country for a strong economy in the generation to come. And I think we need, we're going to need to deal with issues like education and infrastructure and research and development, things that are not where they need to be for us to stay at the cutting edge uh, in a world with sequestration. And I think the sooner we can get to that discussion, uh, the better, because there's actually historically been a lot of bipartisan agreement on those kinds of issues. The, the, the lesson, first of all, should we say sequestration or the sequester? What's the official term? Grammatically sequestration. sequestration. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, that'll change my question. So the lesson I took of uh, what happened with the air traffic controllers was that sequestration is here to stay. That was precisely the sort of thing that people opposed to sequestration, particularly Democrats said, look, there are going to be air there are going to be delays. That's going to focus Congress. We'll get this reversed. The only thing that got reversed were the airline delays. Is sequestration here to stay? Is there any, uh, do you see any scenario, and if you do, can you walk us through it, in which you get that reversed? I, I think that um, if you look, go back to the beginning, the reason sequestration was put in place was to put something so unattractive out there that it would motivate Congress to enact a balanced set of spending cuts and revenue increases. Having failed to do that, sequestration took effect. There's now, I think, a kind of stunning lack of imagination to understand the impact of the effects of sequestration. You know, on the domestic side, it has real impact if you're not making new grants in NIH. In terms of the future of biomedical research and the economic uh, 
developments that come out of biomedical research. It makes a real difference in the military if you're idling uh, fighter squadrons and the planes may not be airworthy and the crews won't have time in the air to go into battle if they need to. These things aren't free. Now, I can't sit here today and tell you I know exactly when that's going to sink in. It's not an on-off switch like uh, the air traffic control. Anyone sitting in an airport for two hours understood air traffic control you know, up close and personal. And it, it you know, I think, had a special you know, kind of uh, immediacy, you know, and that's why there was a reaction. I don't think the consequences of sequestration are policies that are good for the country or broadly what the American people want. I think we have to get on to the debate of how do we have alternative policies to do deficit reduction and make room for the kinds of investments that will keep America on the cutting edge in the next generation. And I can't tell you if that's going to be in the next two months or not, but I have a, a fairly high degree of confidence that what was designed to be uh, a bad policy is going to have consequences that are very unattractive, and one way or another, we're going to find a path to work together on providing some relief. I assume the most likely path is part of some larger deal where there isn't a headline one day that says sequestration reversed. It seems to me that would be very difficult for the Republicans to do. I, this isn't a question of, of um, one side kind of winning or losing. I, I think the notion that there are, um, there are some who are saying sequestration was our great victory. Nobody thought it was a great victory in August 2011. It was kind of the only way to resolve a miserable battle over whether or not the United States should default by getting the debt limit extended and having a frame for Congress to get some more time to make some sensible policy. So the fact that there's now a sense that it's a victory is kind of a little stunning. By the same token, I don't think that this requires you know, the kind of arm wrestling where one side has to win and the other side has to lose. There are a lot of ideas out there about better ways to do deficit reduction. And there are a lot of ideas about there about things we need to do for this country to have the kind of future it should have. And the sooner we can get into the debate about those things, the better. I hope it's uh, this year. Uh, you know, obviously, I think it would be better if it's sooner rather than later. The macroeconomic effect is very real. You know, and um, I, I think, I think uh, you know, it would be a good thing for this country if we uh, took our own advice and got the fiscal consolidation, the deficit reduction, a little bit into the future uh, with the kind of structural reforms that build long-term confidence. It's been amazing to see the IMF criticizing the U.S. for being too austere. Last question, and then I'm going to open it up to a few questions from all of you. Uh, Iran, I think a lot of people don't realize how much time you spend on Iran as the Treasury Secretary. It seems it's it's by far the most likely, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to be misheard, I'm not saying it's likely, but it's the most likely war in, in President Obama's second term. People say he really is serious about this. Uh, there is no sign at this point that um, uh, Tehran is about to abandon its nuclear program. Can you talk to us about your part of that, how well the sanctions are working? And is there any reason to think beyond causing pain uh, uh, that the sanctions may actually move the new regime in Iran. Well, David, we, we need to remember that what sanctions can do is create economic conditions that should change the kinds of decisions that leaders make. I think sanctions are working. I mean, we're seeing it in Iran's GDP. We're seeing it in the value of the real. We're seeing it in unemployment rates. We're seeing it in inflation rates. We are continuing to work on in an international and a bilateral basis to make sure that these remain the toughest sanctions in history because there is that kind of resolve in the world community that Iran cannot become a nuclear power. I know that as Treasury Secretary, the, it, it, it is now my responsibility to make sure we're doing everything we can do, and I, I'm, I am spending a fair amount of time on it because I don't think any president should have to make a decision on whether or not to go beyond economic sanctions without having exhausted the tools uh, available, and we're doing that. We're, gonna, we're, we're staying on it, and frankly, the world community is staying on it. We're c we have not seen the kind of slippage in international support for sanctions that I hear some people speculating about. The sanctions are working. You look at how much oil uh, uh, Iran is exporting, how much access to foreign currency Iran has. It's not a pretty picture from an economic perspective. 
It's a separate question whether the regime will change its policy. Obviously, that's the goal. Uh, the goal is not to hurt the Iranian people. The goal is not uh, just to cause pain to the economy. The goal is to change the, 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 their, their decisions. You know, they've just had an election. Um, w w we're going to need to see whether that has consequences. But they know that time is not infinite. And our resolve is to only use the time we have, but not more than that. The, the troubling thing when I look at it is, no matter where on the spectrum of Iranian politics the candidates are, they seem to be speaking in one voice about the nuclear program. Do you see any evidence of movement there? Look, I, I think that the, the, you know, they do say different things in terms of the nuclear program. First, they, 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 there is the pretense that it's a peaceful nuclear program. For some people, it's not pretense. And I, I, th I don't think we've had enough of a chance to see whether there's a path with the new uh, president of Iran. Uh, we all know the power structure of Iran well, and obviously it's going to require decisions that are made at their highest level. Um, it, it, it would be the best thing for Iran and the best thing for the world if economic sanctions work, because the alternatives are worse for Iran and for the world. Let's, I think we have some microphones circulating. We've got one back here. Um, we've got a question right in the front here. Let's wait to the microphone so everyone can hear it. And I'll go to this one next. If you were the Treasury czar instead of the Treasury secretary, how would you design the IRS and the tax system in the United States? Do you all hear that? Well, Jack just got promoted. That's a, a pretty broad question. First of all, um, we don't have czars, so that's only a theoretical proposition. Um, you know, the, the, the IRS um, is, uh, has got a task that in uh, every society is a difficult one. Being the tax collector is being pretty unpopular. And uh, it's an important job. You can't have a democracy uh, without a tax collector. Uh, on the other hand, they have to do their job well. And the most recent uh, incident that we're dealing with on the 501c4 is very problematic, both in terms of the specific situation, in terms of an inappropriate uh, set of behaviors, but also in terms of undermining confidence in the tax collector. I think the most important thing right now is to do exactly what I directed the new head, the acting head of the IRS to do. One, to make sure that we hold accountable anyone who ought to be held accountable for the bad judgments that were made regarding the 501c4 program. Secondly, to put in place immediately, as he did last week, a way to fix that program, to clear out the backlog and to solve the problem so that that's not the issue. And third, and perhaps most importantly, getting to the question that you're asking, to come forward with a diagnosis of what's wrong that needs to be fixed beyond that. Now, I must say the 30-day report we got last week was encouraging in the sense that there were clear actions to deal with the first two. And on the third, there was a sense that many other parts of the IRS work much better. With that said, he's going to be going out now around the country meeting with field offices. It has to become a better customer service experience. It has to work well. And we know there's a deficit of confidence now that has to be rebuilt. And you know, that's the job for the, th will be the job for the new commissioner of the IRS. While the microphone gets there, quick question. Has it morphed at all? I think some people are, are, have started trying to argue that it wasn't just the conservatives that were targeted, that liberals were too. Or do you still feel like it was conservatives who were well, targeted? I, I think it was clear from the, the r report that was put out last week and from the additional information about lists that were being kept that there was uh, some equal opportunity bad judgment here, that it was uh, conservatives and progressives. It was various different groups. And it's not a good way to do business. I mean, at its core, it was probably people who were trying to operate more efficiently in a resource-constrained environment. But that's not an excuse for bad judgment that's offensive to people's sense of fairness and sensibilities. And that has to be fixed. Sir. Yes, thank you. Um, we have seen uh, instability in the equity in the U.S. Uh, recently uh, to the anti- uh, Hello. Um, 
We have seen uh, instability in the U.S. equity market recently uh, because of the uncertainty in the Federal Reserve mark policy, monetary policy. So are you satisfied with the uh, Federal Reserve monetary policy and uh, communication policy to towards the uh, market? I'll twist that question because I know you won't come. I mean, go ahead. But uh, can you talk broadly about instability in the U.S. markets and, and separately um, your view of current monetary policy? I think as David uh, noted in his introduction uh, and as uh, my friend Hank Paulson will confirm, uh, Treasury secretaries do not comment on monetary policy. So I'm going to have to stay a little bit clear of your question. But I can say that in what I was saying in response to David's question kind of gets to the heart of the matter. We see strength in the core of the U.S. economy. We see it coming back in, in, in housing. We see it come back I not fast enough, but in manufacturing. Um, we're seeing confidence in all the important metrics of confidence, and consumers are deleveraged so that they're in a position uh, that's much healthier than before the economic crisis. There's still many, many things that we're going to have to get right each day and each step of the way. But the trajectory we're on is, on a, is a solid one. And I think that you know, all policies will be made based on kind of the facts of what's going on in the economy. And you can't compare the economy uh, today to five years ago. It, you know, I have the good fortune of coming in at a time when things are starting to you know, get better. Uh, and we have to keep increasing the rate at which things get better. Uh, but it's very different than coming in when the bottom is falling out, which others have had the experience with. Are you playing a major role in, in helping the president decide who to nominate for the next term at the Fed? Not monetary policy. I, uh, I think <laughs> I'm going to uh, stick to my answer on monetary policy, <laughs> which is my conversations on this uh, with the president should remain private. Fair enough. More. Yes, in the back here. Um, in about a week, uh, you will host a big forum between the U.S. and China. Um, could you comment on whether the uh, Snowden scandal, uh, Snowden issue, will wait in any way on the U.S.-China relationship? I think that uh, even since I've been uh, secretary, the brief four months, um, the U.S.-China relationship has uh, been growing and evolving. Um, when I was in China just a couple of months ago, it was the first uh, meeting that the new leadership in China had with any foreign delegation. And we had uh, two days of productive meetings, um, followed by further consultation, which will uh, be continued when we have the meetings in the week after July 4th in Washington. Um, there are always going to be challenges uh, between the United States and China, um, and uh, yeah, I think when I look at the conversation, I think it's more constructive to look at the areas where we can make progress working together than to just focus on challenges. The, the list of issues that we raise with them, that I've raised on a number of occasions with my counterparts, is happily the same list of issues that they need to deal with to make their economy work. Um, they fundamentally have to move uh, from a place where they have a, a, a very a rigid, structured uh, support for old industries, and they go to more market-determined uh, interest rates, market-determined uh, investment policies, opening their markets more to international uh, investment. And I think they understand that. And the fact that there are other issues that do come up between us can't become an issue as we talk about the core economic issues, which are frankly things China needs to do in order for it to grow its economy. I mean, China was growing at 10% plus a year. Now the question is, will they be at 8, 7, or 6? It makes a huge difference in China if they're growing 1% more or less. It makes a huge difference for the world economy, and it makes a huge difference for the U.S. economy. So we're going to continue that conversation. And, you know, we raised, I raised with them issues of cybersecurity when I was in China. Um, and they are very different issues. The core cybersecurity issue that I raised with them was the theft of uh, intellectual property, trade secrets. Um, it is fundamentally a different set of issues, and it's something that is going to remain high on our agenda of issues to talk with them about. And it will be a difficult issue. 
What, what do Americans say to Chinese officials when they say, as I understand they do, you're no different than us? You launched offensive cyber war on Iran. We know you're doing all kinds of things. How dare you lecture us about the rules of cyber war? I think when you look at um, the issues that I've just described, um, the theft of intellectual property, trade secrets, um, state-owned enterprises that have relationships that benefit from those activities, that's just different than other kinds of issues in the cyber area. Th they say to us, and fairly, that we both face risks from outside forces. You know, we, we ha I spend a lot of time, and I talk to bank executives who spend a lot of time, worrying about cybersecurity. We're in a different world. I mean, you, it is not uncommon to talk to a bank CEO who says the issue I spend the most time worrying about is not my bottom line, it's cybersecurity. So there are areas where we have similar kinds of threats. There are other areas where, uh, you know, frankly, that we're just talking about something fundamentally different, which is this area of, of trade secrets and intellectual property. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the challenge uh, in the cyber area is a broad one. It doesn't take a lot of bad actors to create big problems. You know, if you have a smart person on the outside and a bad person on the inside, um, you can cause real problems in systems. You mentioned CEOs. One of the things, and, and we've got time for one more, so let's go back there, that I'm really struck by is whether, whether it's cabinet secretaries, whether it's high-level White House officials, whether it's top business executives, I feel like you just hear again and again these days, I spend an enormous amount of my time on cybersecurity. It's clear that well, it's When you make a list of the things that everyone knows are a real risk and that could be a risk in an unpredictable period of time, cyber is on the list. I mean, it's on the list in the government. It's on the list in the private sector. It's one of the reasons we're working so hard to get legislation on cybersecurity because there's a need for information sharing in the private sector at a whole new level. This is not business as usual. Yeah, the largest institutions have the capacity to build kind of government-like uh, defenses. Small and medium-sized businesses just don't have that. Yeah. And it's only through cooperation and sharing that we can truly protect the systems that are vital to us for our economy. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, on the sanctions on Iran, you talked about unemployment on the rise and also the real is falling, inflation is on the rise. And you also say this is not hurting the people so of Can Iran. you hold the microphone closer? I can't hear. Yeah. Uh, is that okay now? Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want me to repeat? No, we heard that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and then you also say that this, this is not hurting the people of Iran. I mean, if unemployment is rising, if the uh, value of the currency is falling and inflation is high, how is that not going no, to I hurt? I, did, I didn't say it's not hurting the people of Iran. Its purpose is not to hurt the people of Iran. The purpose is to change the decisions the government of Iran makes. And that's the very difficult things about sanctions. When you impose sanctions, even if you have exceptions for things like medicines and food supplies, if you have an economy that's shrinking instead of growing, an unemployment rate that's rising instead of falling, and an exchange rate that's reducing the value of your currency, it has real effects. It has effects in the stores, it has effects on people's lives, on their careers. That's why it should change the decisions that a government makes, because they should want a better life for their people. And I think the community of nations has spoken clearly that a nuclear Iran is a threat to the world. Uh, Iran cannot have nuclear weapons. And Iran is going to have to deal with the fact that these sanctions are serious. It's not the case that they don't hurt. Their purpose is different, though. A lightning round question to finish. If I told you that I think there's a 60% chance of the House passing an immigration reform bill that looks vaguely like the Senate, would you tell me that's too high or too low? I think immigration reform will pass. Will pass, and it'll look much like the Senate. Look, I, th I think that th this is going to be a process that um, will have bumps in the road before they're done, um, but it's going to have to be a bill that can pass the Senate and the president signs into law. And uh, you know, I think the thing about immigration reform that I've worked on this issue for the better part of 30 years. I worked on the 1986 immigration reform. We are a nation of immigrants. We're a nation whose economy has been strengthened generation after generation by people coming to this country with the desire to make their lives better and to make their country better. You look at the Fortune 500 companies, 40% of them were started by immigrants or children of immigrants. You look at new businesses 
you know, high technology, small businesses, 25% are started the same by immigrants or children of immigrants. We continue to be a nation of immigrants. We need to do this for the sake of our economy and for our values. And I think, I think that that message has gotten through. The thing that um, the, the, the fringe benefits of doing it are many. Just at the end of the week, the, an estimate came out uh, that it's going to add to the life of the Social Security Trust Fund by a couple of years. And it shouldn't be a big surprise because you bring millions of people onto payrolls, they pay payroll taxes, and the system is healthier. There, this, this is something that we have to do. We have to do it because it's the right thing to do, and we have to do it because it's the smart thing to do. We can't afford to have kids who've come to this country as small children graduating from high school and then not being able to go to work. We can't have people who come to this country getting a PhD who want to work here but can't get a green card. We've got to fix it for the sake of our economy and for our values. Thank you, Secretary.